I will officially call the meeting to order. Uh, the first item is anyone from the public uh, participating in this meeting? Please identify yourself, your name. Ah, there's a phone number at the bottom. I it's think a 721 that's, that's number. Me. That's me with uh, Mike. Did you just take me out of the waiting room? I did. Right. Yeah, you're all set. So I'm, well, no, we're trying something at the same time. Um, so hold on. So hold on one second. Okay, so you guys can hear me now? Yes. Yep. yep. Perfect. Okay. All right. Uh, so again, I'll repeat. Is, is there anyone from the public who is participating in this meeting? If so, please identify yourself. I'll take that as a no. No, I see no one, Frank. Okay, good. And, and Mike is controlling this in terms of the ability to see people who join the meeting. So at this point, we have no one from the public on the meeting. However, I'll reiterate uh, that uh, it is being recorded for the record according to the uh, requirements. So uh, moving on to approval of the meetings from February 20th, has everyone had a chance to review those minutes? Yes. I make a right. motion to accept. Second. Uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Approved. Aye. Okay. Moving on to the uh, agents of record. Um, you have to turn up first, Chris Monroe. So uh, would you like to start that? Um, I will. Uh, good evening, okay. everybody. Um, okay. In keeping with the information that I had distributed, um, there were three things that I wanted to talk about tonight. Um, one centers upon the year-to-date uh, performance analysis. The second is comments around the July 1st uh, renewal mm -hmm. exercise. And then lastly, I want to share with everybody some work that's been done on what I would call uh, our RX carve out uh, consideration. Yes. Um, as I start to go through some of this information, certainly feel free to stop me and throw out any questions that you might have. Um, when I talk about where we are year to date, um, everything that I'm gonna share with you is based upon claim activity through the month of March. And the report that I distributed is very much the same report that we've used for years. Um, the goal of the report is to take stock in where we are relative to budget. Um, we want to make sure that we capture the number of people who are on the plan, what we have incurred relative to administrative expenses, what our actual claims are, and then compare that against um, what we estimated our cost basis to be from a budgetary standpoint. And the last thing we want to do is pick up and apply um, what I would call some additional offsets. So did we get back money in the form of a stop loss rebate? Um, have we gotten any money back through governmental subsidy programs? We wanna make sure that we're capturing those uh, offsets as well. Um, when you look at where we are year to date, we're for the most part at a break even position. We are sitting on a surplus but when you look at our $8.4 million in total spend, um, we are generally to the good uh, about one and a half percent in a surplus position. So um, not a huge surplus, but a surplus is better than a deficit. Um, the account has driven some consistency, some stability, which is something we didn't see in the prior year, but knock on wood where we sit through the first nine months um, is in a slight surplus position uh, for our current uh, health and welfare plan. Um, before I move on, any questions for me relative to the comments that I've made so far? Yeah. Matt? Matt? Um, I guess the uh, elephant in the room is, do we think the COVID situation is going to affect, um, you know, our any any you know affect what we what we have going on as far as our um yeah. you know our losses yep um good question um couple things um in distributing this update it, i did make a comment on that very same question um <laughs> my gut tells me is that you are going to see a significant drop off in claims through the rest of this plan year um you will see lower claims for april may and june and that is rooted in one distinct driver. 
um, people are simply not getting elective type services. Um, people are being advised to stay out of a doctor's office. Um, people are certainly not moving in the direction of having services that could be put off for a future point in time. And that's going to manifest itself in your claim outlays. So it's a little bit of a short-term game, game, but we have to play the long game. Um, we will finish this year in a surplus position. When we ultimately count the beans for April, May, and June, um, we are going to find that surplus will probably grow to a nice uh, significant level. I think the question that we have to ask ourselves is those claims that are being pended today don't go away. They just pop up at a point in the future. So Chris Monroe, who might be nursing a torn labrum, um, I've had it for a while. I can deal with it for another couple of months, but I'm eventually going to get that done and you're going to eventually pay that bill. Same thing holds true for, you know, the, you know, the knee that needs to be scoped, um, you know, the hip that might need to be reconstructed. Um, the low claims that we'll see, Matt, in the next three months will pop themselves up at some point in the future. So what I've said to all of my clients is, listen, take advantage of that low claim spend over the next three months, but recognize that you're going to have to take some of that surplus that emerges and put it back in the form of working capital down the road when people ultimately go out and get these services taken care of. Um, so as a, in a related topic though, are we concerned about any peaks as it relates really to COVID? We've got, you know, however many members, 700 or whatever it is, mm -hmm. they have to go into the hospital. Now, if there's funds that are being provided by the federal government to treat them, can we use that as not like an offset, but as a stop? Like, you know, there are actually funds to, that we normally would have liability for, which now we don't have liability for. Uh, see, I'm not aware of that. Um, the federal government will step up and fund healthcare costs for um, employers that go the route of not furloughing their people. Um, but as far as a raw dollar for dollar reimbursement on claim expenditures, um, I'm not aware of any program such as that, Matt. Uh, again, the only thing that I'm aware of is the ability to count your healthcare spend for those groups that are applying for those SBA, SBA uh, loans, direct grants from the government. And do we know, is there a, yeah, I mean, I know it from the private sector, you know, what's out there, but I will admit that I don't know the technicalities if there's any of the public sector. Do we, yeah. you know, for keeping our members on, do we get any reimbursement from the government that we can apply for through that program? Maybe Gary's a better one to answer that, but I thought that there was money in there for also yeah. for like municipalities and public entities or something like that, but that's um, beyond my knowledge. Yeah. Uh, you know, I was looking at the statistics in Connecticut, in Connecticut, 70, 80% of the cases are over age 70. So for relatively town employees, that's going to be a, a knockout. That's going to be an issue. And there's only 42 cases in Weatherford. I don't know how many deaths. Yeah. And again, I don't only know three. how many. Only three in Weatherford. Three cases? Mm, three deaths. Oh, three deaths. Okay. And... Uh, I don't know that they're employ town employees or not, but I'd say the incidence of, of COVID-related uh, deaths amongst town employees would be extremely low. Yeah, in terms of the insurance side of things, we're waiting for some guidance from the federal government. Uh, there's nothing that I'm aware of, uh, Chris or, or Councilor Forrest. Um, and Stephanie, I don't know if you've heard anything that would necessarily absorb some of that cost for us. There was talk at one point um, but I don't know on the municipal side if anything's actually come to fruition. Yeah. I have not I heard of anything as of yet. Stephanie. I have not heard of anything as of yet. If if we were to keep people on insurance, if we would get any type of a rebate or any refund, I haven't heard anything like that yet. Do yeah. we have any information about uh, the, um, uh, the uh, emergency services, police, volunteer fire, EMTs in, in town? Are they being monitored with uh, 
regular uh, checkups? Not checkups. Uh, there are procedures in place. Uh, there are procedures in place where they are having their temperature taken before they, uh, the police, uh, before they enter into their shift. Um, we have had some police officers get exposed. Uh, we have had some quarantine. There is a recommendation from the CDC that they can actually, emergency responders can come back earlier than the first announced 14 day quarantine. So we're able to get those police officers as long as they're not showing any uh, signs of COVID, we're able to get them back faster. But you're not, you still don't have the capacity to test them. No. You don't have the no. capacity to test them before they uh, come back? No. Okay. okay. Uh, as of eight o'clock tomorrow <laughs> night, the, the governor said that, uh, that uh, all citizens have to wear masks when they go into a store, all stores, employees have to wear masks. Whose responsibility is that to monitor that? The stores themselves or will the police be involved in that action? Right now, um, the idea is that law enforcement, well, enforcement agents, I'll say, because we have, uh, I know our fire marshal has been very proactive. Um, so it's, it's enforcement agencies that have the ability to close those types of businesses down anyway. Um, so I can't say for sure that police officers are going to be going out in and out of a lot of these businesses and saying, hey, you're not following the procedures. It's more incidental or if they get the phone call. Um, the reality is our force is um, not large enough to handle the volume of these types of calls to necessarily do it. So they do become incidental to activities versus the proactive program. Um, but I can say that I, we've had a number that have, of businesses currently that weren't following the previous executive order in terms of um, one lane direction in terms of going up and down aisles or spacing people six feet apart at registers um, or the protective shields going up and they've been, they've been closed down until they've, um, until they've complied. But again, it's, it's more incidental than it is necessarily a proactive approach. There was no school solution to that, Gary. I just wanted to get a sense for it. Yeah, no, I, it's a fair question to ask. And if I can't, I don't want to take you sideways too far, but we did have our EOC, we have a weekly EOC meeting with all uh, emergency uh, response personnel on staff and essential uh, leaders of essential, essential staff uh, there. Um, we are working on our own internal procedures in terms of masks and protective equipment within the building. We are on a smaller staffing rotation here, so we have a number of telecommuters on any given week. <clears throat> and so we're doing our best to protect the employees and to reduce any, any uh, uh, insurance-related or, or health insurance-related costs associated. Obviously, protecting the interests of the employee. Matt, did that answer your questions uh, from, from Chris as well as the other questions before we move on with Chris? Yes, thank you. Chris, want to continue? Sure. Um, you know, the message, you know, relative to this year, again, is, is pretty clear. Um, we're going to finish up, in my estimation, in a strong position, but um, we have to keep our powder dry for uh, early in the new year when some of those claims come back online. Um, when you look at the rest of the report, um, again, one of the things that always pops up is what's driving your spend. And folks, it always comes down to large claims. You know, the person who's going out and picking up the couple scripts a year, the person who has an office visit or two, that's the person that we don't lie awake at night worrying about. Um, the people that generate substantial claims seem to drive the vast majority of our spend. And if you were to ask me to illustrate it, I'd give you one simple statistic. Um, we have around 1,400 people on the plan. Um, when you look at where our claims are being spent, 27 people have generated 41% of our claims. So 27 out of that 1,400 total membership contributed to 41% of our claims. So a year um, rises and falls when it comes to large claim activity. Um, you know, the concern with the weather's field is we're not a bunch of 22 year olds running around. Um, we've got some people that based upon their age have some health challenges 
and the population is a stable one. You know, you're not seeing a lot of turnover. So the population uh, each and every year just simply ages. And as a result of that, with age comes higher uh, concerns from a clinical standpoint. Um, so that's, again, something that I would always point out. We always have to be mindful of it. Um, this year is no different than prior years. We're going to have those 35 or so people that generate claims in excess of 50,000. If you look at where we're trending, we're trending with more outlay in terms of aggregate dollars than was the case last year. Last year, we spent 3.7 in large claims. This year through nine months, we're already at 3.3. So it'll be quote unquote, um, a problematic year from our large claim standpoint. The saving grace is all the other people have performed well. When you meld the two together, the end result is still going to be a year where we end up in a surplus position. But that's where we are relative to um, our plan year. Um, I think Matt's question allowed us to kind of drill down on the impact of COVID. Um, normally with claims coming down on a regular uh, trajectory, um, that would generally have an impact on our renewal. Um, I think my counsel to the town is we're sitting at around a 13, 13 and a half percent estimated increase for July. Um, we're going to see, again, good results in April, May, June. Um, that doesn't give me even a thought of recommending coming off that 13.5%. Um, that is a number that is a sound number. Um, that is a number that we try to be as aggressive as possible. So even with our fortunes improving artificially over the next couple of months, uh, I'm still reinforcing the fact that the numbers that we put on the table for July um, should stay in place and there should be no attempt to uh, drive those numbers down and result of the fact that we're going to see lower claims spent over the next three months. Chris, How about, oh um, I'm sorry. Um, just, do you get a sense from, or is there any sense that the hospitals, I know a lot of them are, are really kind of, I won't say struggling, but, um, you know, because they have had to defer a lot of these voluntary surgeries is there a chance that they may start them earlier, like in June or end of May, and then we'd still get hit with it? Do yeah, you have a sense of that? It, it's a mixed bag, Tom. Like in all, in personal disclosure, my wife's a nurse at St. Francis. Um, she's in their day surgical suite. Um, they have not stopped doing electives. Um, so it's yeah. not a hospital decision to say, we don't want to do this. They just have patients who have raised their hand and said, there's no way I'm going in there until this thing passes. So are the, okay. are the hospitals, some have taken the hard line and said, no, we are suspending elective surgery. Some haven't. You just don't have the volume of patients at this point. Um, again, it becomes a little bit of speculation. I've had some people who said those services won't come back. That person will live with that torn meniscus. That person will not uh, venture back into a hospital setting because of the fear of infection rates and things along the lines of what we're seeing today. Um, I don't know if I buy that with 100% certainty. Um, I think it just becomes a delayed mechanism. So yeah, these hospitals will certainly want to gear that back up, Tom, um, and they'll gear it up quickly. But um, is gearing it back up uh, August? Is it September? I think it all depends on the whole proverbial, do they flatten this curve and do they feel confident that the worst part is behind us? You know, once we get to that point, these services get geared back up in a New York minute and these hospitals and outpatient surgical centers are going to do everything they can to make up for that lost revenue. <laughs> yes, they will. Matt? You, you look like you were contemplating something. <laughs> I'm always contemplating something. Um, from a budgetary point of view, the 13% adds up to be a dollar figure when we look at fiscal year 2020, 2021. Mm -hmm. But if we're going to end up this year in a bit of a surplus, I think that sur does that surplus end up going to our fund balance bottom line? Or, you know, there's a question about how much do we need to sort of 
tax, raise revenue, however you want to define that, raise revenue to be able to cover it next year. And that's a dollar figure, but can we take some of the surplus from this year, allocate it into next year, and then the council is going to have to weigh to, to fill the rest of that gap. But that's different than just allocating in our budget 13% increase or 13.5% increase. We, have, we get those dollars there from the town in fiscal year 21, 2021. Is there a mechanism by which we can push over some of these excess funds if, if they end up to be that way and say, yes, we're still going to have that amount of dollars in the fund, but we're going to offset it a little bit with some of the surplus from this year. Does that make sense? Hopefully. I, I can address that for you, Matt. Thanks, Mike. Um, we, whatever we budget for medical gets contributed to the medical fund, which is separate from the general fund. And so the way we would accomplish what you, what you're, what you're describing would simply be to estimate what we think our surplus would be in year one and then uh, figure out what our budget would be in year two to fully fund and then reduce it by, by some amount that we you know, estimate the surplus from, the, from year one to be. The contribution into the separate fund because it's, it's not held in our fund balance. It's held in, um, I'm sorry, I forgot the name of the fund. Yep, it's a medical self-insurance fund. Okay. Yep. All right, so I guess for Gary, that's something to just consider if, if in fact the trending continues. Not that we're gonna not fund it at Chris's level, but if there is a bump, it could help be an offset. And then just, just to remind everyone, we do have a policy for funding the medical self-insurance fund um, and for maintaining a certain level of reserves there. I believe it's four months worth of claims as reserves, and we've been above that for a number of years. Um, and then we, our policy also uh, dictates that we can use any excess amount in the medical fund and transfer it into the OPEB trust to fund the, the OPEB liability for retiree medical. So it's just, that's all, that would all be part of the discussion of, of doing something along the lines of, of what you're describing, Matt, would be, you know, understanding those policies and, and that there's, there's other things, um, there's requirements for the reserves in the self-insurance fund, and then there's other um, mechanisms out there to use those reserves. But that could certainly be done to answer your question. Okay, thanks. Chris, you want to finish up on your part of the... Uh... Sure. Um, the last thing I wanted to make everybody aware of, and we've talked about this in prior meetings, um, is what I would call uh, our RX carve-out considerations. Um, one of the things that we had looked at in the course of our recent marketing initiative was the viability of cutting away from Blue Cross and forming our own direct relationship with a pharmacy benefit manager. Um, We've gone through that exercise. Um, we've pulled in proposals. We have vetted those proposals. And we've actually had uh, a, a web-based presentation with a vendor who will help us navigate that potential course of action. Um, there is real value in a carve-out strategy. Um, where does that value uh, originate from? Um, there's two drivers that influence what we spend in pharmacy costs in a given year. Um, the first, as you can imagine, is the discounts that are being no negotiated on our behalf. Um, obviously, in their role as the incumbent, uh, Blue Cross is out there negotiating pharmacy discounts through all of the major uh, pharmaceutical, uh, our pharmacy chains, CVS, Walgreens, Rite Aid, um, they're out there negotiating this, those discounts on our, our behalf. Um, so that's one driver in potential savings. The other one is on what I would call rebate sharing. Um, when a brand name drug is dispensed, in many instances, that drug manufacturer will pay uh, a rebate. And there are instances where we get some of the rebates, um, this marketing exercise was aimed at trying to look at ways to get more of the rebate. So those are the two cost drivers. When we estimate what we think the savings will be, 
Um, we're putting the savings in the range of 200 to $250,000 on an annual basis, okay? That certainly got our attention. So we certainly went down the path of vetting uh, various pharmacy benefit managers in order to realize that $250,000 savings. What we then also needed to look at was the potential disruption to our members. Um, all of our benefits are bargained. So you needed to be sensitive to formularies. You needed to be sensitive to certain clinical programs that are in place because at the end of the day, you don't wanna create an environment where the member is significantly disenfranchised through any potential change. Okay. Um, where we are now is USI, in my capacity as your agent, have endorsed a move to express scripts. Um, in that move, we would partner with a third party, a company called RX Benefits to help us navigate that move. But based upon the four bids that we pulled in, we felt that the best by far was Express Scripts insofar that they were driving a slight discount advantage over Blue Cross, but a significant advantage in the form of rebate sharing. Uh, when you combine all of those advantages, when you factor in some adjustments that Blue Cross will make on their admin fees if they lose the pharmacy, we still net out to that $200,000, $250,000 savings uh, under Express Scripts. I think it also drives a level of transparency that we don't have today. Um, we have struggled with getting Blue Cross to stay consistent in terms of sharing with us the terms of the contract and being on point as far as the financial ins and outs of our current arrangement. <clears throat> we get a better level of transparency through this arrangement. So from a financial standpoint, it became an easy endorsement on my end. Um, once we got to that point, we had to pivot and then look at what is the potential impact to our members. Um, the last thing you want to do, again, is create disruption. Uh, in measuring disruption, we followed a very simple exercise. We got from Blue Cross what I would call a pricing file. That pricing file reflected every single drug that our members have used in the last 12 months. There were 21,000 drugs or 21,000 scripts generated by Weathersfield members in that 12 month period. Out of that $21,000 number, um, 437 of those scripts would not be available through a move to Express Scripts. So we were saying it another way, we had 98% of all scripts that Weathersfield enrollees are using today would be available in a move to Express Scripts. So it is not what I would call a disrupt, disruptive migration. Um, it is not disruptive at all when you're moving over 98% of your utilization from one formulary to another. So again, the goal was to try to make sure we satisfied, is there a financial benefit? Yes. Is there a impact to our unionized workforce? Um, I think the answer is no. Um, we are starting to bring the union into the discussion through a series of webinars where we are prepared to share with them that pricing file share with them how we counted the beans, if you will, in order to make sure they are comfortable with the logic that went into measuring disruption, what we think is a minor um, adjustment relative to those 437 claims. Um, and we think there is nothing but positives in this move to Express Scripts. Could I ask a question? Um, when you um, indicate that um, they will, that there are 98% of, um, of, the, of the formularies that are um, available through Express Script, are there any particular, you know, some of, um, 
at some point, people may require drugs that, or um, some type of uh, med that is maybe, is really expensive. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, so would, what would happen in the event that, um, uh, you know, that that was the case? It, would it be somewhat, is it, it when there's that 2%, does that mean that those drugs aren't covered at all or that they would be paid as um, just basically out of network, what, you know, with, for lack of a better term, um, like you would for any other, you know, because some, I mean, there are some drugs that are costing people a couple of thousand dollars a month um, yep. or would if it wasn't covered by the uh, plan. Yep. So good, good question, Polly. Those 437 drugs, members would no longer be able to get those drugs. If they wanted them, they're paying out of pocket for those drugs. Oh, okay. There, there is always an appeal process if that member's physician feels that they need access to those medications on a continued basis, they mm -hmm. can always appeal it. Um, I think it's important to kind of drill down on that 437. A good chunk of those drugs might be drugs that were filled once or twice. If you were to focus in on that 437, the one that would represent the greatest number of utilization is an asthma inhaler. And what Express Scripts would say is you're correct. You had 136 scripts filled for albuterol, which is a generic inhaler. We don't have albuterol. We have Proair or Ventolin as our inhalers. Now, I'm not asthmatic. But my experience is that people view inhalers from a standpoint of an inhaler is an inhaler. So whether it's Proair, Ventolin, or Albuterol, I um, generally am somewhat agnostic to whatever inhaler I use. Now, if the physician feels differently, then the physician, again, always has the right to say, no, this is why I want somebody um, or my patient to have ac continued access to albuterol. So we tried to approach it, Polly, from a standpoint of making sure that those drugs that came off were not blockbusters, that weren't 500 okay. strips of one particular drug. I think we've covered that base, but again, okay. there, therein lies why we want to have these webinars to say to the union, um, here are the drugs that come off. Um, you know, so you can wrap your arms around the impact of what this means to you and your members. Okay. Chris, just for clarification, earlier you said there were 21,000 prescriptions that were honored? Scripts. Scripts, okay. And of those scripts, there were 21,000 drugs. No. So therefore the 437 number is the number of scripts that wouldn't be honored or the number of drugs that would be honored? Scripts. Okay, Correct. so 437 scripts could be much fewer drugs. If, you, if, if 100 people took the same drug for 12 months, that's 1,200 scripts. It's, it's, 40, it's 40 drugs, Frank. So oh, 40 four, drugs. Oh, okay, all right. Thank you. Yeah. Four, thank you, oh, thank you, Frank, yeah. I, I'm not a mathematician, but I do hear well. Yeah, 40 <laughs> drugs come off. I thought I got 437 drugs. Yeah, <laughs> no, it's, no. That's a yeah. lot. No, okay. okay, thanks. Four, 40 drugs that were responsible for 437 scripts. Got it. Okay. And All what right. I would say, Frank, is of the 40, about 25 of them had less than 10 scripts. Okay. So the real meat on the bone is 15 yeah. drugs that had 10 or more scripts generated okay. in that 12 month period. Okay. That, that's certainly a, a much more chewable number. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I, and I can say, you know, like, and I was, and like you, Chris, I'm kind of, if he doesn't want me to take Lipitor and he wants me to take something else, I don't care, it doesn't matter to me. Yep. I also say that in the 12 years I've used Express Scripts as a retired uh, military, their customer service is brilliant. 
it's unbelievable. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I, even though, even after they were purchased by Cigna, I feared something would happen. Not at all. They are a plus when it comes to turbines. And 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 folks, here's the here's the. I'll give you. I'll illustrate the reason that this is a real viable option. And again, this is the games that people play. Um, Blue Cross will say, "I don't get this." you're getting 100% of the rebates from us. Why would you leave us? You're getting 100%. And that number has floated. They told me they think it could be 450,000. They then have come back and said, no, we think it's more like 300,000. Then they come back and say, nope, it's 550. So there's a lack of credibility in their ability to stand behind that number. But here's the problem that we have is, um, they are gonna give us 100% of the rebates. What they don't give us is, carriers or drug manufacturers that will pay a rebate but call it a marketing reimbursement. We'll call it advertising dollars. They keep that themselves. So on $700,000, we're getting potentially all of that back. Whereas with Blue Cross, they are carving out hundreds and hundreds of thousands that they call marketing dollars or administrative advertising support dollars, and they're keeping it themselves. It's a rebate. It looks like a rebate, it talks like a rebate, it walks like a rebate. But Blue Cross puts a different name on it that allows them not to share it with us. Um, we are looking to avoid that. And I think we, we take a great step in avoiding that by going direct with one of these large uh, pharmacy benefit managers. Okay, good. Matt, uh, I, I, I think I know where you're going. So you, Matt and I for, for, um, we had a conversation back in, let me think, February before I went on to Florida. And Matt, that's exactly the kind of thing on prescription drugs uh, that would get the attention of somebody at the state level that what we're doing with, with Chris Monroe. Agreed, uh, but directly to the point, and just so I'm clear, the drugs that would not be available under the new forum, there are what I'll call like companion drugs or it's a non-generic that is under the express scripts Yep. It's just maybe not either a particular generic or maybe there's a slight difference in the organic chemistry of it, but there's still a drug to treat whatever the underlying ailment is. Is that right. accurate, yep. Chris? Yep. And then, so, and, go and ahead. Let, me, let me illustrate an example. You, you had 28 scripts filled last year for Victoza. That could have been on three, four, five members. Say it's five members. Those folks, Matt, will get a letter from Express Scripts that says, hey, um, Victoza is not on our formulary and it's not gonna be available to you after July 1. The alternatives that you have access to would be uh, Bidurion, Bietta, Ozempic, or Trulicity. So you're giving the member four options to say, hey doc, is there any reason why these four won't do the trick? And if the doctor says, yeah, because they have a particular binding agency, we need you to be on Victoza, then that doctor can go back to Express Scripts and say, let me tell you why Matt needs to stay on Victoza. And, uh, and if Express Scripts buys into that clinical argument, you stay on it. If the doctor doesn't care, then you move to any one of those four. And then on the other side of the coin, I'm curious if does Express Scripts have a set of drugs that Blue Cross Blue Shield doesn't? So you're also opening up a lot of windows as well. Because I guess I would think if we were on Express Scripts, Blue, Shield, Blue BCBS might say, come to us. We've got, you know, yeah. all these. So is there the opposite side of that coin? There is. Now, it's impossible for, you to me for me to measure because I measured it against what did our people actually use. But there were probably a couple instances in that last 12 months where somebody was prescribed the drug they took it to that pharmacy counter and that pharmacist said, I'm sorry, Matt, that's not on the Blue Cross formulary. You're going to need a different drug. And then your doctor had to come up with the different drugs. But you're right. There clearly might be some instances where a drug that was not under the Blue Cross formula, formulary um, is now on the Express Script formula, formulary and the member can now get it. The other thing, it, it stand, and I'll say this to the unions in the webinar, uh, Blue Cross takes drugs on and off the formulary each year as well. So it's not as if, hey, these formularies are cut in stone. There's always turnover on the formulary, but 
you know, from where I sit, 98% is a hell of a match. It's a hell of a match. And uh, we're putting in place alternatives and you're also putting in place the ability for a physician to appeal this if they so desire. Uh, Chris, how is the uh, union dealing with this? Um, I'll let you know next week. We're gonna have uh, four or five webinars next week. And I think um, I'll have a better feel for kind of what they come to the table with. My experience is gonna be, um, hey, what, is, what does this mean to me? And it's not gonna mean uh, a whole lot unless you're those, <clears throat> those 437, those 40 odd drugs. But you know, they'll wanna know that, uh, Greg. Yeah, that's fine. What's that's the formula? Just anxious to see what they have to say. You got it. You know, where does the town benefit in all this? And what I would say, you know, if we realize that 200, 250,000, well, guess what? You know, your premium is now on a cost basis that's $250,000 less than it would have been if we stayed with Blue Cross. It and then they say, them in, that, in that way, too. <laughs> yep. So they'll, you know, next week they'll come in and they'll want to know what does this mean to me and what's the impact? And uh, my approach is I'll, I'll let you look under the tent. You can see everything that we did and you can kind of go through the 21,000 uh, line file. So you know exactly what drove the comments that I've made today. Thank you. Yep. All set, Chris? I'm all set, folks. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Chris. Thanks, Chris. Thank you, Chris. That, Thanks, that's, Chris. That, that's excellent, yeah. And let's see, where did Chris Borger move to? Where are you, Chris? There you are. You're right below. You're right below uh, Chris Monroe on the screen. Your well, turn. Hopefully that wasn't just symbolic, just electronic, right? <laughs> Can everyone hear me right now? Yes. Yeah. All right. Great. Don't and, move. Uh, I, I commend, <laughs> I commend uh, Mike O'Neill for helping set this up, and um, also want to give him kudos for wearing the shirt and tie, which is something I haven't seen lately. Not a lot of people. Pretty cool. Um, what I thought we would do is start with, uh, you know, the, the agenda item, which is, you know, affecting all of us personally and professionally, and that's just the pandemic, really insurance and risk management considerations will stay pretty high level uh, at this point, uh, and then we'll go and, and touch upon the two other agenda items. Uh, I will tag team with Ashley Rita, who you all know. Hi, everyone. There she is. I have to say, it's really good to see some familiar faces and interact socially. So thank you. You're welcome. So glad to have you. When it comes to just the, you know, the idea of this pandemic, like how does it relate to a municipality, whether it be a town and a school district? What USI has been doing, uh, first off, we do have our own landing page, so we have a ton of information, um, but you know, municipalities are getting tons of information from legal advisors, benefits, uh, property casualty, you know, just all over the place from their carriers and whatnot. So what we're doing right now is, number one, remaining on call because questions are coming up you know, by the hour um, we're keeping track of the different types of questions that the towns and the school districts are asking. They're, you know, it, it, things are changing. Like I've said that some of the answers we're giving are perishable, meaning that you know, statutes are changing, legislation's being, being put forth, as your, as your chairman has just said too. So we're, um, what we're doing is we're looking at uh, the changing legislation, we're monitoring the executive orders, that are here in Connecticut, as you, if, if you do, you'll notice that Governor Lamont has gone from A to Z. He is now on AA as of, I think it was yesterday. Uh, so we're doing that, but, but what we wanna do is um, we'll talk uh, first about workers' compensation, and then um, I might touch upon a little bit on cyber uh, property, and then um, get into a couple things related to that. So um, what I'll do is, um, out of respect for Ashley and Kerma, because they're, they're fielding a lot of questions regarding workers comp. They have a process, they have an approach um, that they are taking. So um, Ashley, would you like to comment a little bit on that side? 
Absolutely, and thank you again. It's really great to see everyone and interact. Um, you know, right now we are really monitoring everything that goes on, especially with our frontline workers, our police, our fire, our EMTs. Um, Kerma has put up a coronavirus dedicated website that has a lot of frequently asked questions. As far as workers' compensation compensability goes, obviously we're going to wait and see what comes down through the state, through the governor, you know. Yeah. Does anyone your... have any specific questions right now as, you know, the workers' compensation? I just have something I, you know, <clears throat> I mean, obviously there are different, um, you know, different takes as far as uh, how and when um, the state is going to get people and certain segments of the population back to work. Mm -hmm. And what I'm wondering is if um, we would be open to some kind of uh, workers comp liability if, for instance, um, mm -hmm you know, someone doesn't feel they're ready or um, someone believes that they were infected at work or, or that kind of thing. If, has there been any concern about that? You know, as, as far as concern goes, and as Chris mentioned earlier, I mean, all of these questions and statements that we're making today, the shelf life on them is, you know, we'll see what tomorrow brings. Um, but, you, you know, we've, we've really been taking all of that into consideration as far as, um, you know, our, our pricing and our aggregate need goes, but, you know, we, we do anticipate to see some things again, like I said, I mean, it's kind of too early to tell it really, you know, it depends on what comes down from the state insurance department. Yeah, Polly, to, to complement what Ashley said, so, and it ties to one thing I mentioned about legislation. Around the country right now, there are two states, the state of Washington and the state of Kentucky, who actually modified their workers' compensation statute to get triggered for first responders who are exposed to COVID-19. But in the majority of other states, including Connecticut, the workers' compensation statute has not been like fundamentally changed. So there still needs to be an investigation of the circumstances. If you have an employee or a, say a volunteer firefighter or ambulance worker, there needs to be an investigation of the specific circumstances that led to them alleging that they've been either exposed or they've been confirmed positive after a test. Um, so it's, it's that classic case of ordinary illnesses such as flu and common cold. It's really tough to isolate exactly how they got it. But mm -hmm. here in Connecticut, you know, especially with first responders and some other types of employees, which some people are even viewing public works employees as falling into a category. Um, there are some special, and I'm gonna answer that, I'm gonna follow up to part of your question. There are special claims teams. I know Kerma has the, the head of their claims unit, Mike Wampold, who is looking at each case and being sensitive to those. Um, but what we're also doing, we've done an investigation on some of the coverage language in some ancillary policies, which are generally called accident sickness or accident and health policies which can supplement workers' comp benefits for volunteer firefighters and ambulance workers. So, so really, um, you know, the big, the big question is, and Chris, thank you so much for bringing up the legislation. Um, as far as workers' compensation goes and, you know, everyone working remote, for the first responders, it's a little bit more clear cut as far as Kerma's coverage goes. Um, and I'll send this information through to Mike and Frank and, you know, they can share with everyone as needed. But like I said, Perma has a website designed specifically for this current situation that answers a lot of questions. But, you know, for generally speaking, a real, a real world example, um, you know, those employees are volunteers who have contracted COVID-19 where it, they are first responders and it can be, you know, identified where they may or may not have contracted the disease. Again, every claim situation is unique and dependent upon the circumstances. But generally speaking, 
workers' compensation should apply for those emergency workers. What's going to happen as things change and go into the future as far as, you know, those non-frontline employees, it remains to be seen. Um, but even, uh, you know, volunteer firefighters and ambulance personnel are eligible to receive, um, you know, some benefits from the KERMA program. And like Chris said, we do have our accidental death and dismemberment policy in place. It's for our volunteer firefighters, but it also covers paid fire also. Um, just uh, Polly, so a quick follow up on part of your question. And Stephanie, I think you're still on the line. I think you're muted at the moment. Um, but have you had any situations within the past couple of weeks where employees who are not first responders uh, came out and maybe went to the supervisor and said, you know what, I'm just not comfortable working. I'm staying home. Uh, have you had that situation? Because it, it doesn't technically fall under the workers' comp system, but it absolutely is, it's risk management, it's employee benefits, it's human resources. So kind of curious, not to put you on the spot, but just wonder if you've had any so far. We actually have. Um, and what we have advised those employees, if you are uncomfortable coming to work, um, if there's an opportunity to work from home, there is that opportunity. And in some cases, there is not an opportunity to work from home. Uh, and of course, employees can use any accumulated vacation earned personal time. Um, and a couple of other comments I wanted to make is we have had some of our first responders um, get exposed. Um, we've actually had one uh, who's been exposed three times. <laughs> um, so I have been in contact with KERMA almost on a daily basis. Uh, because we have to coordinate the emergency paid sick leave. Um, and then if they are able to prove that uh, they were exposed by someone and if they're testing positive, there is some compensatory uh, issues there. So it's a, it's a coordinated effort um, between the emergency paid sick leave that we have and then workers comp also. But I, I've been in communication with KERMA I would say every other day, at least, if, if not every day. So we're keeping a very close eye on this and especially our first responders who are, um, who may have been exposed. Yeah, thank you, Stephanie. And obviously this goes without saying, if you have any questions or concerns, I'm available, our claims team is available, our executive team is available. The USI team is available, whatever you guys need, you know, we want to do the best we can to support you through this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. And I, I want to, I want to thank all of the first responders in your community too. And, you know, all of those people who are working at Stop and Stop and the hospitals, you know, it's some, some recognition and gratitude is definitely deserved it, I think. Definitely. Chris or Gary, do you have a question? I was just going to make a joke uh, to Ashley's comment. If you have any questions or concerns, I think it's safe to st say that Stephanie uh, and Mike and I have a lot of concerns. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Gary. I think, I, think, I think Stephanie hasn't slept since March 13th. So uh, it's been an ongoing issue, one right after another here. So. Yeah. Well, you guys are you guys are really doing a great job. Um, yeah. You know, and and the uh, I just want you to know the town and. The town staff that I've um, communicated with have done a great job of getting back and, and uh, you know, doing the best they can. So, um, you know, th from the, uh, the point of view of being on the outside, I, I really, truly appreciate what they're doing. And I know it's hard work. So um, please pass that along. We have, we have an awesome group of employees that are very dedicated. Truly, um, and some of them, it's easier to come to work rather than stay at home, which is a positive. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I was just going to ask that. Everybody is, is everybody's doing fabulous. And very committed, very committed to making sure that we can still, you know, give some support to the the citizens. Right. Uh, everybody's very concerned about being able to provide support to the citizens, and everybody's working together. You know, make sure their their departments covered, and 
it is, it's what I think it's great. I, yeah. We have some awesome employees that have been going above and beyond. Paul, and I, I thank you for noticing that because I think a lot of people are confused with the fact that town hall and town buildings are closed, but we're actually still open for business. And when you look at our volume of um, permits and, and um, just people processing through through the town clerk's office, assessor, tax office, we're actually the same volume, if not higher. The only difference is we're doing it in a unique way that we've never done before. We're using online, we're using email, we're using phone. So, you know, I think people are a little bit confused, like, well, you're not working. Actually, we're working harder. Yeah, um, we're using yeah. Different tools in different ways and still providing the same level of service. We're just not as visible or as accessible in the public's mind because they're used to just walking in. Um, right. And, I, you know, to Stephanie's point, I can't say enough about the, the cross collaborations that are going on. Unions get a, a lot of uh, bad rap. The reality is we sat down with them early and explained this is a unique situation and everybody's kind of, I mean, there's always a push, but um, everyone's kind of come together with a realization that we have to work together to get through this. Um, and there's been a lot of flexibility, which I think has been, um, speaks volume about of the workforce that we do have. Sorry. I'll yeah. And also I appreciate the fact that the meetings have gone well. <laughs> Everyone I've talked to has been on a, uh, uh, one of these uh, meetings with uh, town committees have, for the most part, had, uh, you know, had really positive things to say. So, um, you know, one being um, my husband who's on planning and zoning and was uh, very concerned about being able to, uh, to make it through. So uh, it's worked out well with the system, too. So I appreciate that. You know, I said to Chris Wardrop earlier, he and I were on the call, as all of you or most of you know, I came from the commercial world and I have such a great appreciation for local government and what the community does and, you know, to pull together and, and everyone, the police, the first responders, public works, it, I really have, a, a, you know, a, a greater respect and admiration for, for all that you do. So again, thank you. Hey, Chris, uh, Wardrop, uh, in interest of time, uh, do you want to uh, finish up part B on the open claim review, or do you want to go right to the renewal? Yeah, here's what I'll do. I'll, I'll do, it'll be very, very quick. Um, just to, as you know, one of the most important tenets of what we do at USI, and I know you do too, it's part of this meeting, is we never go on autopilot, right? Make sure that there's forward momentum. Make sure we know that there are next steps and there's a continuation. There's a sequence of things to help make sure we're helping protect people, stuff, and budgets. So the claim, I wanted to mention a claim review only because at least once a year, but we've been doing it twice a year, um, we get together with Kerma to, and, and town and, and school district leadership to take a look at the largest claims, look at the status, look at the strategy, and just make sure that there's good sharing of information, looking at you know, overall you know, reserve dollars and things like that, but mostly making sure that there's a good strategy so that we can ultimately work to get claims closed in the right way. So we did that, we had a, a, a successful claim review meeting, and when we did that, and this go, ties to that quarterly uh, loss review or loss summary. Um, for the current year, I would just simply say that both on the workers' compensation side as well as on the liability auto and property side, in both areas, if you look at total incurred dollars, so this is open and closed dollars, um, things are looking pretty good. You're in, a, you're in a good place right now. So as we get you know closer to July 1st and we do um, more evaluations, just know that there are a number of eyes looking at this. We're looking at the trends, and so far for this year, it looks good. And then, um, you know, the the irony with the pandemic <clears throat> is that, you know, on especially on the school district side, you know, you have less. Um, there are some activities that are just simply lower in risk, and so we're going to see a period of time where both the frequency and the dollar value of claims will be at a lower level, most likely. Um, but, you know, again, we want to be careful about that. So yeah. that would be... But, yeah, but I'm sorry, Chris, to interrupt. But on the flip side of that, I've been having a lot of conversations, obviously, with a lot of 
towns and and local public agencies across the state um you know we we do anticipate to see sort of a decrease of claim trends on the boe side simply because there isn't that physical interaction but on the flip side we're you know we're also contemplating all of the overtime that the first emergency responders are having so we may see you know a little bit of um you know, or an improvement on the BOE side, but perhaps maybe offset on the town side. You know, it's, it's hopefully everyone will come out of this safe and healthy is really all we're looking for. Yeah, that's a good point. Very good point. <clears throat> so um, any questions on either, uh, you know, the first or second agenda item before we go into the fiscal year 21 renewal update? Oh, proceed. Nope. All right, thank you. So, so as you know, again, as we go week to week, month to month towards July 1st, um, there is a, a natural sequence that comes into play. So um, this is the month where there begins to be a formal exposure review, uh, where we're looking at property values, we're looking at, you know, a number of different things, auto count, equipment, looking at, you know, payrolls and things like that, and trying to come up with, um, you know, a, as accurate a picture as what the exposure base is and will be. Um, and so that's something that's going on right now. But um, probably the most important part is how does the, you know, how, how do things look with the renewal at this point in time as we get closer in terms of rates and that type of a thing. So I'll, I'll turn it again over to Ashley in our um, well-orchestrated plan here. <laughs> Thank you kindly, Chris. Um, you know, I'm, I'm really happy to say our, you know, pool aggregate rate needs were determined prior to the outbreak of the pandemic. However, we've been having constant communication with our actuaries and, you know, where we're, the, the reason why we have the surplus that we have is for situations like this. Kerma's pool was, you know, sort of birthed out of unfortunate situations like this. Uh, you know, we appreciate the town and the BOE side. I know they're not represented here necessarily fully tonight, um, but we we really are happy to offer the town an extension in their three-year participation on our rate stabilization program. So as Chris said at last month, oh, yay, Stephanie. <laughs> Funny, I was half listening until you said that, and all of a sudden, <laughs> me too. I'm just kind of like, oh, I look, I look well, like Steph doing this. Yeah, no. So, so for the upcoming renewal, we're at a plus three percent over the expiring. Obviously, not contemplating any change in exposure, and we've also extended, like I said, another two years after that in the. Um, stabilization program. I have yet to send the formal information out. I will do that after this meeting. And for the workers' compensation, I, I'm, you know, I would like to do better, but right now we're looking at a, a plus 3% increase, which is right on target where Chris said last month at, at the meeting. So we're looking at plus three and plus three on, on both lines of business for the town. And again, you know, that's sort of contemplating where we are now, where we've been, and potentially who knows where we're going to go in the future. But again, you know, Kerma is, is here and we appreciate your support and commitment. And it's at times like these, like you said, when everybody comes together that, that people pull through. Yeah, one of the, um, <clears throat> Mike O'Neill and I had talked uh, within the last uh, few days. And one of the things that we do at this point, um, like first off, USI, we have a kind of like a pretty decent view, both in Connecticut, regionally and across the country at what's happening with the various types of carriers and reinsurers that work with municipalities. So as we take a look at this, first off, I'll just say publicly that a low single digit rate commitment is very good in this marketplace. So right out of the gate, I'll say that. And I will also say that when it comes to evaluating carriers, it's really quality-based selection. It's looking at the total value. It's not just a price. And that's a very important thing. And you, you, you see that come out all the time when you look at claims handling, you look at response. Um, you know, Ashley's with us right now, right? <laughs> so that's an Thank important you. part. 
<laughs> no, you're welcome. Um, but it's also incumbent on, on us to take a look and make sure to kind of bulletproof, you know, ask the, the tough questions. How are the reinsurers doing? How is Kerma doing financially? Mm -hmm. and, and so what we'll do at USI with our team, we take a look at, you know, loss ratios, look at the latest totals, and, and then kind of take a look and say, okay, how does plus three plus three look, but also look down the road. Right now, and like I just did a, a speaking engagement with an association, and we were talking about current market conditions in the insurance world, but also what's happening for July 1st, 2020, and what do we think might happen down the road past that? Because some of the carriers who work with Connecticut municipalities also work with the private sector. The private sector is currently getting pounded because of no economic activity. That means that some of the carriers are going to feel that impact in the third and fourth quarter and going into next calendar year. And we also have some legislators who are pushing to see carriers expand their coverage or have coverage grants on a retroactive basis. So there is so much going on every day that, um, uh, just know that we're very, very serious with the type of um, review we do here. But I will, again, I'll just reiterate that um, I don't think Kerma has gone on autopilot whatsoever, and I love that. Um, but I think um, we'll continue to work closely with Kerma on behalf of the town and the school district. Thank Any you. questions? Nope. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Oh, thank you. Thanks, Ashley. Ashley for, what, 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 uh, hold on. Hold on. Oh, okay. Matt, do you have a question? Yeah, just the three the three percent, is that the three percent above where we are right now and then hold that three percent for three years or is it accumulative? So, it I'm, so I'm really glad that you brought that up. On the workers' compensation <laughs> side, coming into this year's renewal, we're actually, we've since changed our filing. So our audits are now premium neutral. So what we're going to do going into the 2021 term is take plus 3% off of the most recent audit and automatically roll the renewal. We've already had our actuaries look at it. The state has approved it. So it, it takes a little bit of pressure off of our municipalities. So we're still gathering the renewal information and we still need to go through the, auto pro the, the audit process. But at renewal time, I'm not gonna ask Stephanie to provide me with every payroll by class code. We're just gonna take the most recent audit, increase everything by 3% and then not adjust it at the end of the policy period. So basically we're collecting what we're anticipating up front and then there's gonna be no adjustment on the back end. So we'll keep all the dollars in the same fiscal year. Um, so Councilor, it, the, yeah, sorry, thank you. I'll, to compliment that, the, um, so the, the LAP policy has, and it's pretty unique in the marketplace today, there's a, there's a multi-year rate cap provision as part of the budget stabilization agreement. So, and, and Ashley can expand upon this, but to, to help answer the question, it's a rate cap, which means that if loss experience, you know, supported by risk management measures mm -hmm. go down, then KERMA can come down. And we've actually seen this already happen this, this year. Yeah. On, the, on the workers' compensation side, however, that will be an annual review. There's not a multi-year option. And it's in part, um, and Ashley can compliment what I'll say here, because I'm sure I'll miss something. The, 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 the environment in terms of statutory benefits, it's, it's difficult to know a year from now if there will be further expansion of say a cancer presumption or, or something of that nature. Obviously PTSD was, um, you know, that was something with mental mental claims for, um, for certain classes of employees that got expanded this year. So uh, workers comp will be a year to year, um, but you know, again, a lot of the work behind the scenes with risk management practices are designed to 
work to get the dollars. In and, and, and thank you, Chris, for bringing up risk management, because that's one of the reasons, you know, why we're willing to extend the participation. So Weathersfield is actually entering their last year of their current three-year agreement. But again, given the commitment, the risk management efforts, the cohesiveness of everyone involved, we want to keep you in this program. You're, you're valuable to the pool. You're important to us. You are doing all of the right things and you know we appreciate that and you know we're willing to to be to be there for you in the long haul and like Chris said the the maximum increases so it would be three percent over the expiring years premium not contemplating any change in exposure so that's so if you end up buying you know five new fire trucks that's going to change things a little bit, but for the most part, you know, you're, you're not looking at more than a plus 6% increase over the next three years. So if I'm doing budgeting guidance though, am I, so in the premiums for the next fiscal year, I would anticipate being 3% more? Off of the expiring premium, correct. Yep. And then is that a hold for three years or is that net another 3% in the second fiscal year? So, so it's potentially another 3% in the next two years. But like Chris said, we reevaluate the losses. That's a maximum cap. That's not a guarantee. If you've implemented some sort of new risk management process and you know we're seeing the results immediately and I can improve upon that number, I absolutely will. I absolutely okay. will. So it's a maximum cap. It's not necessarily what you're going to get. It's the worst mm -hmm. possible increase. Understood. And then it's the third, and then the third year is the same thing, another possible 3%, but it's a 3% cap. Over the prior year. Correct. So we would do 2021 off of 1920, and then, so it's off of the prior year, but yes. <clears throat> so if things didn't go well, we had some bad experience and claims and so forth, it could be a 9% increase over three years. Could be. Or maybe more because it's cumulative, so it'd be 3%, but then another 3% on top of the 3%. In, unless so, there there is a substantial change in exposure, and Mike, I know that you can speak to this, and Chris as well, you know, we've been in the program for a few years, or at least a couple of years, um, and there hasn't been any major change in exposure that has drastically altered the premium. So, so really what you are looking at for budgeting purposes, I would say, you know, do 3% over your current enforced premium, and that'll be for the next three years, at least on the liability side in the, as part of the, the rate stabilization program. And I'm guessing that also comes with the, I think if we've got a very good claims record over the year or the pool has a very good claims record over the year, there's actually a rebate that occurs. Is that still in place, I think? That, that, that is correct. Um, okay. We have our member equity distribution program. It's Thank been you in for place the technical for, language. I think, I want to say about <laughs> 10 years. Um, and I think out of those 10 years, we've made distributions for nine of those. So basically, Kerma obviously is a non-for-profit organization. So, you know, we keep our surplus in order to protect you and the rest of Connecticut in situations like this. But also, you know, when, when we do finish the year and it's a good year and we have extra money, we do return it to the pool. So I can't guarantee you that you're going to get that this coming year. But there is a member equity distribution program, yes. And is that done on a fiscal year basis or a calendar year basis? Um, I believe our board votes on it at the end of, of December, so the end of the calendar year. And then we notify our members who renew with us whether or not it's happening. We usually deliver checks like July or August. Yeah, I think so it's so a this year. For this year, we would know already if we're getting a rebate in July or August from the previous year. So it's actually a three-year process that it goes 
qualify, you have to be a CURMA member for one year in order to qualify for the, the distribution. Then the year that the second year is the year that you know your experience and your return is based on, and then you have to be a CURMA member for that third year to actually receive the return from the prior year. So we actually do not know at this point what the equity distribution is going to be. But we've qualified for all that because we've been around for three years at least. Oh, absolutely. So, absolutely. And this is the end of our policy year, so we should be expecting we should know what can you let us know what the rebate's going to be on this i guess i i don't know if there is definitely going to be a rebate or not again that's the decision it goes um from karma's executive team up to our board of directors our board of directors votes on it so karma makes a recommendation as to whether or not we have the financials to make the return um our board of uh selectmen you know approves whether or not they agree with it and then we make the return so i have not heard that there will or will not be a, a member equity distribution this year i don't know if the board has made a decision on it or not but i, I promise as soon as we know we will be letting everyone else know okay yeah, but, would, um, would that not have happened in december though as per your no. recent guidance you know what has happened so if, if you allow me to um actually to jump in so what and i i track these pretty closely uh, and i know that um the member equity distribution <clears throat> when it is voted on and approved it's it's been somewhere around three to five percent maybe a little over five percent of the premium but the the way um the sequence of events that i've seen is that it generally is begun to be talked about in the springtime. The voting process with the boards, the voting and the approval process generally takes place into the month of June. I think last year it was towards the end of June when it was finally approved. And part of the reason is that Kerma has to take a look at a lot of the, um, the financial variables, including their reinsurance contracts, the retention of the members, the total premium volume, and those types of things. So yeah. it's, it's, it's um, unfortunately, it, it ends up being voted on and approved literally right before your fiscal year starts. And then if it's approved, the distribution of that money flows into that same exact fiscal year you have. So a lot, of, a lot of leaders that we have talked with, a lot of our clients have said that they're not including that money in their budget because, you know, obviously the timing is off, but it's something that they look at as, well, if we get it, we hope we do. Um, and if we do, we're going to apply that in the most, you know, important areas that we can. Yeah. Thank you, Chris. Again, I mean, you know, given given the current state of events, the board hasn't voted one way or the other, as far as I know. Um, it does have to do with surplus. And again, you know, Kerma's top priority is maintaining the integrity of the pool and the availability um, and access to reasonable insurance. So, you know, if, okay. if we do have it, we, we obviously will distribute it. If the board feels that it makes more sense that, you know, given the uncertain circumstances of our current situation, that perhaps we should keep that money in the pool because we don't know, for example, how the workers' compensation compensability may change. It's variables like that, like Chris said, that really come down to the wire that factor into it. So the board's going to decide in uh, May or June. Is that what I mean? Correct. Okay. Yep. Uh, about 10 years ago, we had a conversation in order to reduce our premiums. And one of the key factors was sort of slip and falls on sidewalks and mm -hmm. that we were seeing a pretty good, uh, you know, rate of claims. And then the town made a concerted, a very specific concerted effort to fix the sidewalks, not just for the altruistic idea of having nice sidewalks and be on the bike and, and ride and walk with safety, but also because we were able to specifically determine that, hey, if we put in X amount of dollars in sidewalk improvements, mm -hmm. we can reduce claims and reduce our, and we found that, and we found that benefit in premiums. 
is there that possibility now 10, 12, 14 years out from the last time we did that in order to be able to do some research to see if we can allocate some dollars to sidewalk improvements and lower the premium at the same time, thereby lowering risk, lowering risk? So I can't answer that question for you right now tonight. What I will do though, is go back to our risk management team and have them do a stewardship report, which really analyzes all of the losses, where they're coming from. So we can really drill down into sidewalk claims over the past 10 years, specific locations, you know, whether or not we're actually seeing an improvement in claims. And we absolutely can look at that. And as the underwriter, you know, if there have been improvements made, I will absolutely contemplate that. Okay. It was uh, just to the insurance group and some of you are probably were there when we did it with Jeff Kotkin as a leader in that area. Uh, we were finding that if we spent, like, say, like $100,000 in sidewalk improvements, not only did we get it in sidewalk improvements, but you offset that with premium and you were getting sort of like a, a multiple of two, three, four per, four per one on your dollar because the dollar you were spent fixing this stuff, you also were getting a reduction in premium. So it was going a little bit further. And that was a very um, Jeff Cocken at the time doing the analysis, along with you guys, made a very cogent argument that was really successful. Yeah, and, and I can definitely provide that information to Gary and Mike, um, you know, as far as the dollar amount of sidewalk claims by year. Um, and like I said, I mean, it, at this point, it's kind of hard to get risk management really involved because they're really hands on and sort of face to face. But we can do that, that uh, you know, data analytics and really drill down into the sidewalk claims. And I'm happy to provide Weathersfield with that information. Thank you, that'd be very helpful. Yes. Chris, anything else? Uh, nope, that, that really summarizes it. But you know, the last thing we would say is how we always finish, especially in the pandemic era that we're in, <laughs> is that we do remain on call. So if the committee has different questions, funnel them through uh, le town leadership, and we will work um, round the clock to get you answers. But just know that you know, if there was ever a time to you know, really be there for our clients. It's right now. Thank you, Chris. Thank you. Thanks, okay. Chris. Yeah. Going, Polly? Nope. I just was saying thank you. Okay. So, <laughs> and I'm looking. I'm not looking for a motion until I'm finished here. So don't preempt me. Okay. Uh, <laughs> any other, I know I you want to have dinner. Uh, <laughs> yeah. is there any other business we want to discuss at this point? Anybody? Okay. The next meeting is on May 21st. And while we will have the meeting, because the governor is holding the state in suspense until the 20th, we don't know if it's going to be another teleconference or it's live. Uh, if in fact we're open for business, how do you all feel about having a live meeting in person on the 20th or the 21st? Or would you rather have this again? Any feelings on that before? I at least at this point, I think, I think we, we should leave have. that. Uh, I think we should leave that up to town staff. See what they yeah. feel comfortable with. We've got a month to, um, okay. you know, okay. to let them cogitate over it. Okay, uh, I, I, I would agree. Our, our, um, yeah, Gary. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you're assuming I'm going to let you in the building. Yeah. <laughs> yeah see, that's it. <laughs> For other reasons, okay. Frank, not just this. Not because of COVID. Yeah, I, I don't doubt that. Okay, uh, and Gary, you know, we'll take direction, you know, from you and from Mike uh, as to uh, the when and the where of our next meeting. And, and, and it's in summary, uh, before we adjourn, uh, thank you all for your participation. It's been very thank you very much. Thanks, guys. Well, I make a motion to adjourn. I second. I knew it was coming from him. <laughs> <laughs> any, any other discussion on that? If not, a second. I don't think so. <laughs> I've got a second. All in favor. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I have a, I, my hey. sauce is burning, guys. I'm All in done. favor of the motion to adjourn? <laughs> Aye. 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 Good night. We're done. Thank you, everybody. Good night, everybody. Thank you, Thank you everyone. Stay Stay safe. Stay Stay safe. Bye bye. Leave me. Yeah. Just, just quickly. Hold on. Yep. Yeah. Oh, no, it's all good stuff.